you can't go out there and qualify like I qualify if you only get 15 leads a year. My guys get a minimum of 100 leads per year. So they can afford to be a little choosy, okay? So don't kid yourself. Don't go, right, I'm going to go and qualify like a ninja. And then all of a sudden you look around and there's nobody else to talk to. You know, if you're going to get two leads a month, guess what? You're quoting both of them because you need them to survive. How old are you going to be before you start to experience life like you want it? I want to tell you right now, whether you like it or not, there is a better way to do business. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Business for Builders podcast. Uh, my name is Max. I'm your host. I'm the CEO here at Smith & Sons, and uh, I'm the founder of EliteBusinessAdvisory.com. Uh, for all your customized contracting uh, coaching needs, uh, shoot across there. Hey, guys, um, really quick intro here. Like and subscribe. Leave a comment. Give us a little bit of a rating if you're feeling generous on your preferred uh, podcast platform. Uh, helps us get the word out there and we want to get that, uh, you know, we want to contribute to uh, reducing that 50% failure rate of us builders and general contractors in the first five years. So um, gave a big intro on the previous episode about what I'm doing. We're right in the middle now of a three-part series to do with the pre-construction agreement. I hope you're loving it. Look, feel free to also email. The email is, my email is on that elitebusinessadvisory.com website. Um, if, if you want to just shoot me an email about a specific question regarding yours and you prefer not, you just haven't got the time or you don't think it's necessary to catch up with me on a Zoom call, then that's cool as well. Just give me a bit of time. There's always a little bit of a backlog for me to get through. Um, so uh, don't forget uh, Business for Builders, VIP, Facebook, fa uh, Facebook page. Um, if you want to get over there and uh, join that group for a bunch of collaboration community, um, we, can, uh, we can do that. And uh, just answer the questions. And if you're a good sort, I will let you in. Uh, it's, it's what we need to do. We need to talk amongst ourselves a lot, a lot more. Okay, so uh, without further ado, and uh, without the big introduction as per the last episode, hope you enjoyed it. Um, like I said, email if you've got any little fine-tuned questions you want to run by me. Um, what I'm going to do today is, is uh, just cover off another four points in, in conjunction with the overall objective to uh, get into a pre-construction agreement with your clients. Now, it doesn't really matter if you're doing new homes or renos, um, but we we here at Smith & Sons, we do uh, all fixed price. Mo well, we do mostly fixed price. Maybe 1% of our work might come out of a, you know, a friend that wants to do cost plus, and that's the way that some of my guys want to do that. Um, but more often than not, 99% of our work is fixed price. And so we want to make sure also that um, you know, we are having our, we, we, our time is being covered financially for the work that we do in pre-construction because there is a significant amount of work to be done on, you know, most times. Um, just, you know, some of the small jobs, sure, it might not be as much and it might not take as long, but nonetheless, our time is super value, valuable. Okay, so I'm going to quickly talk about a couple of strategies around the points um, you know, especially in the first meeting, because what we're trying to do is demonstrate to clients the value. If we don't demonstrate the clients, the investment in the pre-construction agreement, because there is going to be one, um, we've got to make it clear what it is that, that if they can't see the value, how do they go and then, how do they go and understand whether or not the, the investment that you're asking for is worth it or not? And that's, that's the ultimate play. So, um, let's just keep talking about in the meeting. So in that first site visit, because this is a lot around this, a lot of this happens in the site meeting and then it flows out to the activity after the first site meeting. So um, we're going to talk about what I use a lot of the time when I'm talking to clients to help them, I, I guess, to try and demonstrate my authority is that when I'm talking to a client, I'll say, Mr. and Mrs. Homeman, I just want to let you know that there's three factors that are going to help you and I come to an agreement. And the reason that there's three is because if I don't get one of these factors lining up on, you know, as it relates to you and your project, we will not be able to do a deal. And they're like, wow, okay. And so, you know, what I'm going to share with you guys today is exactly is exactly what I would do. I'd say, look, Mr. and Mrs. Homeowner, if I can get these three, three, three things to line up, then we'll do a deal and I will be your builder and I look forward to being your builder or your contractor. The first one is aesthetic. Your project must be aesthetically aesthetically pleasing. We, we both agree on that. Um, it has to have a high level of functionality. It must do the job that it's designed to do or that you want it to do. And it must fall within your financial capabilities or your financial wherewithal. You must be able to obviously pay for the project. So 
Um, there's no point in having something that works well, that fits your financial uh, constraints if it looks ugly. There's no point in having something that maybe looks good, fits your financial constraints, but, but, but doesn't work well. So that's why it's imperative that those three characteristics are obvious as it relates to what we are working on and designing. How does that sound? Like, I, will, I want that engagement. I want the head nod. I'm like, yeah, that sounds good, Max. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Good. Okay, so now I know what to focus on. Yep, Mr. and Mrs. Homeowner, that's a great way to start. Everything that we look at, that's what we want to do. So we want to really use those, use aesthetic appeal, functionality, and financial constraints as key assessment tools. So, you know, I think sometimes people want to do ungodly things with their home and it's just not possible. We can't make it function the way they want. I know they've got some grandiose, you know, idea as to what they want, but it's sometimes if they're not, if there's no flexibility between aesthetic value, functionality, and the financial side of things, it's like, Max, I'm only spending 10 grand on this bathroom. Well, not only does it, it just, it's a deal, it's, it's a deal breaker. It's a no-go. And I think guys and girls in that first meeting, if we use those three approaches or three characteristics of the deal, then what you can find is that it's going to highlight who are your players and who are your pretenders. And I think I finished the last episode by talking about that, the, the fact that we do want to separate or we want to identify who are the players and who are the pretenders. And so if they are going, Max, I love the fact that if you can get it to work that way, um, it's great. And, and, you know, we love the aesthetic appeal. We think it'll look awesome, but they've only got half the budget in mind that I've got in mind. <clears throat> that again is a deal breaker. And so, um, you know, what we're trying to do is figure out in that first meeting who are our players and who are our pretenders. So, you know, we want to discuss how the factors will guide us through the project in the design planning phase to ensure the best outcome for them, the homeowner. So, you know, that's that's really something that I use as a, as a tool to ensure that I get to the conversations that I want. And again, that could be part of your, you know, when you, maybe you set the agenda in, you know, which I would, an overview of the agenda before you go to the meeting. And it's like, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Homeowner, just want to let you know that I've got to get there. I've got to have a look around. I've got to listen to what it is that you need. I'm probably going to take some basic measurements. I'm going to take some pictures and some video of your, you know, the area where we're going to do the renovation so that when I go away, I've got some data to fall back on. And I'd like to I'd like to get in and out of the meeting in about 30 minutes. So that kind of talk is what's going to make you look like the authority because you're like, okay, this guy, let's not waste his time. He's, he's on a mission. We've got to get all the information to Max in that time allotted. Otherwise, we may not be able to sort of, you know, he, if we don't get him a good understanding of what we want, um, you know, this thing's going to drag out longer than it should. <clears throat> so once I've got through that aesthetic, um, you know, those, those key assessment tools, you know, the aesthetics of the project, the functionality and the financial constraints, the other thing that I get is when we start talking about, I think we finished off the last episode talking about this, is really establishing what the, <clears throat> their expectation is. We've got to then reconcile that against what our opinion is. Now, we can't just go and say, well, I think you're wrong and I think it's going to be 25000 for your bathroom, not fifteen. Unfortunately, what you've just started is a tug of war and then they're, they're now suspicious of you because they think you're just trying to rip money out of their hands. Now, the way that we, the, the, our, our counter to them, you know, sometimes I'll do this. I'll be like, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Homeowner, what is, <clears throat> what, <clears throat> what is your expectation around, you know, the, the build cost for this, this bathroom? Before they respond, I'll say, look, I'll tell you what, and this is my next point, rely on your experience and historical data. Before they respond to that, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Homeowner, I think that you're going to, you know, I, I, no, excuse me. Hey, Mr. and Mrs. Homeowner, what's your expectation around the build cost for this? And I'll say, Max, we want to do this bathroom for 15000 Now, I will either let them say that or I'll ask them the question and I'll say, look, don't bother answering that. Based on my experience and my historical data, now that I've seen your, you know, your bathroom, it's probably going to be between twenty two and 30000 Mr. and Mrs. Homeowner, how do you feel about that? I'll let them talk. And see, what I'm trying to do is, because we understand that buyers maybe don't give us the whole truth or they're not prepared to give us the whole truth, I've got to set the bar. I've got to break the ceiling. I've got to get that conversation started. And I've got no problems doing that. Now, some of the guys that maybe have just been a carpentry contractor for the longest time, they don't have the historical data and the experience as it relates to, you might have just got a builder's license or whatever, 
um, or you've just launched you know, your general contracting company and you don't have that historical data. I would encourage you to reach out to me and have a quick chat with me or book, better still, book a consultation about this because there's, you know, we can talk about, you know, I wouldn't rely on square foot rates to go quoting, but to give a high and low, I'd use a square foot rate, use it as a baseline, add 40%, and there I've got a high and low price, okay? We've got to have these mechanisms that we lean on to enable us to control the narrative when we're dealing with clients. If you do not lead, then you will end up following the client. I had one instance over the weekend, one of my elite business guys said, Max, I'm just about to put this proposal out. We talked about it in our previous session the week before. And they said, the client, I've, I've, I've got the thing finished and I want to go and meet the client, but the clients asked me to send it before the meeting. Now, for me, when I present proposals, you don't get that. The first time you see that uh, project proposal is in our meeting. It's just simple as that. And I said to this guy, I said, look, if you let them have that, that means A, you're now operating out of our process, outside of our process. B, you've now yielded to the client and you've set a precedent, which means that if they ask for it, they get what they want. And it is a fairly, you know, it's a ballsy move to go and email the client. Hey, Mr. and Mrs. Client, look, I appreciate the fact that you would love to see this before I get there, but it's a very complicated and technical proposal and I'd really like to go with go through it with you page by page. I look forward to catching up with you next week at our, you know, our date and time uh, that we've set out for that meeting. If you've got any questions, let me know. So, you know, I think when I talk about setting boundaries and manage expectations, maybe the situation could have been handled in the first meeting. And this is something to take note of. You say, so what I'm going to do, when we, if we do go into the pre-construction agreement, which is prior to the construction agreement, and we come up with an overall price and a proposal, I'm, I'm not going to send that via email. I, I'm going, I've got more respect for my clients than that. We're going to sit down over your dining room table uh, or you're going to come to my office and we're going to go over this in great detail, which is going to take a couple of hours because it's the size of the project is going to demand that attention to detail. See, by setting the agenda, not just for a meeting, but for the whole process, you know, and I know that I've had some of my, you know, uh, clients and even for my own Smith & Sons website, we have the design plan and construct process. I, I'm really looking at how I can apply more micro detail to that to give the clients more education about what it is that we do actually in the pre-construction process. And so, you know, I think a lot of the time when we talk about, you know, when, when clients hear me say, based on my experience and my historical data, A, they can't, they can't argue with my experience. And B, if I talk about data, we've tracked that. You, we've measured that. We've always been about improving that. So we've tweaked the numbers. We know exactly what we're talking about. It's very hard for you as a homeowner to argue with me when I've referenced my experience in historical data. Now, please don't be a bullshit artist. That's not what I'm asking you to do. I'm legitimately saying that if you've got that experience and you're not using that to your advantage in a meeting like this, then, then you're, you're really doing yourself a disservice. So it's important. We want to draw on personal experience to guide the client through potential challenges um, and solutions. That's part of my job as a builder. My job is to insulate the client um, from the challenges that are contained in a renovation project or even a new build, okay? So that was point number six, rely on experience and historical data. That's super important. And it's a massive advantage to help you in the, in the pre-construction you know, sales process. Right, number seven, introduction to design and pr uh, design plan and pricing process. So... <coughs> So what we want to do is we want to really shed light on the complexity of the design and plan process. This is not where I can just go and pull a bunch of random numbers. It starts with a bill of quantities. You know, yes, we're going to renovate the bathroom, but I've got to calculate how many hours go into the, the demo side of it. I've got to calculate roughly what my, uh, you know, demo debris uh, disposal cost is going to be. Like all of these calculations, these bill of quantities and establishing the rates, the complexity around that design plan and pricing. That is, is super important that we talk about that. And we're going to get a little bit deeper in that probably in the next point. So we've got to highlight the need for detailed data gathering, including measurements, undertaking quantity takeoffs, which I just talked about. The selection process, identifying everything with aesthetic value in that project that only the client can choose. And then obviously the the compilation of all the data as it relates to specifications and inclusions. You know, it's important when I'm talking 
um, you know, to the clients that this is part of the demonstrate the value. Because <coughs> if, you know, really, guys, just as a, a kind of a rule of thumb or benchmark, um, I would say roughly 1% of the, <coughs> the forecast build value is kind of a starting point. But a minimum is going, you're going to charge us about 500 bucks. You've got to be able to, you know, you know, demonstrate to the client at the highest level what it is that's involved, not the micro, but the, the moving parts that go into, you know, the pre-construction phase. Now, the next point, my last point for this episode is supplier and subcontractor coordination. So this, this really ties into the previous point. In demonstrating, you've got to help the clients understand that Mr. and Mrs. Homeowner, I've got to do all of my due diligence around your project. I've got to make sure that I've got a good understanding of your project. We've got to spend time working with you and perhaps your interior designer. Now, before I was just talking about, you know, your 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 cost, uh, or sorry, your fee for service, you, you know, as part of the pre-construction agreement, interior designers are not included. Engineers, geotechs, soil tests, all of that is not, you know, land surveyors, that's not included. They're design services that are needed, you know, as part of the process before we go to building permit uh, or might be. And there's going to be from costs that are, are going to be needed to be established in your ecosystem. And so, you know, to be able to talk and converse with all of these design people as well as then, you know, trapping all the data from the project, I've got to then be able to, you know, uh, forward that information to all of my suppliers and my subcontractors. You know, I, as a builder, want to minimize the amount of thinking. So maybe I can do a bill of quantities and then maybe I can just cross-reference that with, you know, my price list that I might have from my preferred hardware supplier. <clears throat> but in some cases, I've just got to give a breakdown of the scope, let's say, to a painter and then allow him to come back or her to come back to me with a price, you know. And so, um, you know, for, I think that is a, a large component, not including the, the design side of the of the quote, but you know the the, the suppliers and subcontractors, you know things like uh, you know trust manufacturers, they are really not going to give you a, they will give you an indication, but they're not going to absolutely give you a hard and fast design and process without seeing some of the engineering plans. And so you know we've got to emphasise the responsibility that we have in regards to answering any queries that our subcontractors and suppliers have relating to, you know, the client's project. Um, you know, we've got to explain to the clients how as the, the general contractor builder, I've got to furnish both suppliers and subcontractors with the appropriate information, um, you know, that in some cases, multiple suppliers, multiple subcontractors for the same scope, because maybe I want two quotes, okay? Um, and so, you know, with key information, um, that they require to provide a quote for me for supply and or, you know, uh, materials, supply and or supply materials and or uh, labor. And then I've got to co coordinate with the various suppliers and subcontractors to gather accurate and competitive quotes in a timely fashion. So I might say to the client, I've got to get this information. Um, and once we go to a pre-construction agreement, I've then got to dispatch that information to subbies and suppliers and then I've got, to, I've got to answer their questions on the way through, which means I might have to, you know, talk to you, the homeowner. Then I've got to make sure that in two weeks that we get quotes back because unfortunately, subcontractors and suppliers can sometimes drag the chain on getting me the pricing, which means that delays the start ultimately of your project and the completion date. So there's, you know, I've got to crack the whip. I'm the guy they're accountable to. I've got to oversee, you know, the whole process. And so, you know, uh, th that's my job, Mr. and Mrs. Homeowner, is to insulate you from all of their excuses and just get the job done. See, when I talk to homeowners, guys and gals like that, they go, okay, you know, Max is really, you know, going to front, you know, he's going to, you know, quarterback it or he's going to run point on this and he's going to lead the way and we like that. You know, some clients say to me, oh, Max, well, I want to supply vanities or I want to supply this or that or I've got my brother-in-law who's an electrician. Um, I think at my age and my experience, knowing full well that I want to put that house on the production line and get it to the end of the production line as quickly as I can, I know that that's a potential vulnerability because it's kind of outside my control. I don't know what type of work or how he works. I don't know what his quality you know, assurance programs are like. That to me is a vulnerability in delivering that finished product at the end of that, uh, you know, into that uh, manufacturing process 
Um, and I don't want that. I want to stay, you know, I want to maintain order within my delivery process because that ultimately, you know, is, is, is a control mechanism. And so that might be something that's a deal breaker. I know that you want to work with clients. And look, guys, the harder you qualify, the better your lead generation to fill your top of funnel must be, okay? Um, you can't go out there and qualify like I qualify if you only get 15 leads a year. My guys get a minimum of 100 leads per year. So they can afford to be a little choosy, okay? So don't kid yourself. Don't go, right, I'm going to go and qualify like a ninja. And then all of a sudden you look around and there's nobody else to talk to. You know, if you're going to get two leads a month, guess what? You're quoting both of them because you need them to survive, okay? So be, be sure to take this, this three-part series on this site visit and the communication, the conversation you're going to have around the site visit as it's happening and after the site visit with, with some common sense and understand that you've got some deficiencies in your business program. I think I talked on TikTok. Be sure if you don't know, we've got a TikTok. We've got a business for builders TikTok. Get across there and check it out. Um, but, you know, I talked about that if you've got your branding and marketing sorted out, You've got your lead gen and inquiry management sorted out. You've got your sales and your pre-construction process sorted out. And of course, you've got your, your, your building process sorted out and your after sales, um, you know, or your warranty period uh, program sorted out or protocol. Then you know, you're, 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 in, you're, in, you're in a really good position to develop a very strong business and very profitable business. I just want to make sure that you're also, you know, in your estimating and quoting phase in that pre-construction that you are pricing the jobs in a profitable way that you're assessing your daily cost to run that business uh, whilst you build that, you know, that project, all those kinds of things. So you've got to make sure you've got a very broad understanding of what happens in the business. You can't just focus on and go, right, I'm going to qualify hard when your branding and marketing is not happening, when your sales process are not in place, where your estimating and quoting is not really up to up to par and up to snuff. So guys and girls, get across to uh, Business for Builders VIP, check that out. Hit me up on max at elitebusinessadvisory.com. Get across to elitebusinessadvisory.com, check it out. If you can't, uh, you're not in a position to consider full-time customized uh, contractor coaching, then maybe check out the 21 Silver Bullet Academy on that same website. Um, be sure to like and subscribe, leave us a comment, give us a bit of a rating if you're feeling generous, uh, wherever it is that you listen to podcasts on and um, shoot me an email if you've got any questions, but um, stay tuned for the next episode um, and uh, look forward to sharing more about the, uh, the, you know, the, the site meeting and everything that's contained and wrapping up this three-part series on the pre-construction agreement. Go build a kick-ass business and I will see you on the next episode. Cheers. Cheers.